we're going to do, just continue to talk about recalibrate and what it means. Now, Dot and I have lived at Merrimack for since when? 19, <laughs> no, 2004. That's right, 1st of August, wasn't it? Okay, and we've decided recently to recalibrate. Yeah, it's true. Due to a uh, solar power evangelist, who shall remain nameless, but thanks, Sam. Um, <laughs> he sent out this thing earlier in the year, about February, on Facebook, and all it was was a picture of his latest electricity bill. And it was like $6.50 or some ridiculous number. And that got me thinking. I don't know why, but it got me thinking, am I paying too much for my power? And so we decided to go from one thing, which looks like this, now, if you can see it, there's a white arrow just below the black numbers and that. The white arrow indicates what this meter does for you. It only measures one direction. How much am I using and paying for? That's all it does. And so that's the best I can get out of that meter, is what I have to pay. But have a look at this. We recalibrated, and this meter you're looking at is about a week ago. 1,620.2 kilowatts that have been generated from my rooftop, or our rooftop, by the sun. Absolutely free. Well, not quite. We had to put the system in. But you know what I'm saying. So the good news about that is, I looked this morning, it was 1,729.4. And I've used from the power company 1,500 and 66.7. So if you're a mathematician, I'll tell you what it means. We've produced 110% of what we use. We're over and above what we used to use. Now, I'm just here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, get your faith. No. Well, I'm not a salesman for this stuff, but I'm just saying there are times in your life where you have to stop and recalibrate. You have to go back and measure again in a different way, ordinary things, and find out what's another way of looking at them. And that's really all we're doing in a series like this. So we can forget about the power, that power, for a minute, okay? It's, uh, we've been looking at it from different words that God has shown us as a church. And so Pastor Nita helped us out with freedom, all right? It's not just the freedom from, but uh, freedom to not do certain things, okay? Freedom to do what God wants and freedom from doing what we don't need to do. And Pastor Kev took us boldly beyond where people fear to go into the deeper places of our life. And uh, he talked about that journey of knowing our inner self and digging out wells that may have been clogged up for many years. And, and we do a series in the church here called EHS. If you're not sure what that means, it's a bit like NASA. They have short things for everything. Well, EHS is Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And that was a great time for us to, very difficult time for many of us to dig down deep and find a new beginning. Then came Dr. Phil, uh, Brother Phil, who talked to us about irresistible I know you all think I'm irresistible. No, not that kind. It's the irresistible to God kind, the kind that says God will favour you because you're just the kind of person that he loves to have, the per person whose heart is turned to him and really dedicated to what he wants. Not irresistible to people, but irresistible to God. And uh, Phil gave us 12 points, which we're going to go through right now. No, we're not. But... Uh, <laughs> Then we, um, he also mentioned to us a book called uh, Irresistible Church. It was written by Pastor Wayne Kidiro. Have you heard the news? Pastor Wayne has been given the all clear on his cancer. Praise God. Hallelujah. Your prayers have been answered, <laughs> along with many others. <laughs> but isn't that a great joy to hear? Now, Pastor Simon led us into the courageous moments of our life. Uh, courage is not that absence of fear, but resistance to fear. And uh, he talked about the 20 seconds of, you know, what do they call it? Outrageous courage or something like that. You know what I'm talking about. When you do that thing that God is calling you to do, 
Like we were singing that song earlier, uh, I Surrender All, and I can distinctly remember as a young Christian, God saying, get up out of your seat in the, the church. We were singing that song and go to, we used to have these wooden altars in the front where people would come and kneel and pray, and go to the altar and take out your keys and your wallet and put it on the altar. And that, at that age of about, I think I was 19 or 20, I did have a motorcycle, so that was the keys. And I had my, my wallet, and I put it there, and I said, God, this is the deal. I know you've given me everything that I have, and so I just want to lay it down for you. And it really defined my, the rest of my life, the way I lived, who I married, and all the things that we did together as a family to this very day. And so... You know, this is courageous moments. You do what God says, even if it doesn't feel comfortable at the time. And then there was Pastor Kev talked about intentional, and everyone plays. I love that theme. And uh, the church that I see, if you haven't caught up with that, it's available online. Have a look at it and get into it. Well, let's move on quickly. Today, we're going to talk about something that... It's a bit like, um, you know, I get old and I can't get up out of the chair. There's, I need PE, physical exercise. Well, there's two PEs in the church that we always find difficult to talk about. One is prayer and evangelism. Well, what I mean is we can talk about them and talk about them and talk about them, but doing them, it's like PE, you know. It's one of those things you know you should do. You'd like to do more of it. But do I do it? Do I pray enough? Do I actually evangelize to tell people that you can get cheaper solar? Or anything else that we're keen about? You know, we do evangelize every day, don't we? But do we do it about Jesus the way we need to? Putting my hand up here, no, I don't. And that's why God gave me this talk to talk about. Multiplying is living mission. Everyday disciples making disciples every day. So that's where we're going with this. We're going to have a quick look at the Bible in Luke chapter 5, and it just says here, the heading, which wasn't inspired in Scripture, but it says the first disciples. So we know this is a valid part of the Bible to talk about discipleship and making disciples. One day, Jesus, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the Word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. And stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. And when he had finished speaking, he said this to Simon. Now go out where it is deeper. Hmm, where did you get that word from? And let down your nets to catch some fish. Master Simon replied, we worked hard all night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I will let the nets down again. That's intentional. And that's what he did. And at this time, it says the nets were so full of fish that they began to tear a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realised what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught as they were as were the others with him his partners James and John the sons of Zebedee who were also amazed and Jesus replied to Simon don't be afraid from now on you will be fishing for people and as soon as they landed they left everything and followed him wow what a passage yeah i could leave right now and that would be enough no okay i won't Still got a few minutes left. All right, so I want to say this about it as we unpack it a bit more. Would you say that they caught an additional amount of fish or multiplied number of fish? 
You know, if you start with zero, it's hard to multiply zero by anything, but we're going to say everything other than that is a multiplication, right? If you've got two or three or four. But somewhere, you know, it just got to that point where this experienced fisherman and his friends were awestruck by the number of fish. We're talking about a catch that they had never seen before. There was something exponential about Jesus getting involved in the situation. It was more than just the slimy fish and thinking about how much longer they've been up all night and now they've got to clean this fish. It's, <laughs> you know, they're thinking about this just doesn't happen. Now, let's think about this. What if Jesus had have said first thing to Simon rather than push your boat out so I can sit in and preach? What if he had said then, oh, Simon, from now on you're going to be a fisher of men? He would have thought, who, me? Come on. If only Jesus knew just how badly I suck at fishing sometimes. <laughs> like even last night, caught not a thing. And that's about my attitude sometimes to evangelism. If only God knew what a bad bet he had in expecting me to be the next step in someone's faith in him. <gasps> Do we play it down too much? The problem is that we focus on ourselves as the fisher person rather than the message, the good word of God, the news about him that is going to do the work rather than the Holy Spirit who's going to do the multiplying. You see, it's not about us at all. It never was, never will be. You could be the best evangelist in the whole world and still not be blessed by God. But if you're the best faithful servant of Jesus, then you will be in the right place when he says, put down the net. And look at the catch you will get. So, we need to, to know that the point here that Jesus is making is that he was totally clued up to what they needed to know about this whole thing. See, from this day onwards, they would always say, what was the biggest catch we ever had? It was the day that Jesus turned up. What was the biggest successful day that we ever had in the boats? It was that day. And then from that day onwards when he said, it says they left everything and followed him and they became fishers of men, they would never think, well, how are we going to survive as followers of Jesus? He had already provided for them the greatest catch. He's the sort of person that when you follow him, what you need will be there to continue his work. And so that's the kind of thing he's saying to us. When Jesus declares from now on you'll be fishers of people, it's on the back of who he is and what he's going to do with that statement, not who we are and what we feel about it. We've got to get that in our minds because for me personally, that becomes a blocking point that I need to move past. And as soon as they landed, it says, then they left everything and followed Jesus. So the principle here is the miraculous provision of God. Jesus promises that if you do faithfully what I ask you to do, then faithfully I will turn up and you will have the fruit. So when we talk about multiply, it's not like you're going to have to do it. It's like you're going to have to be faithful to God. You and I are going to be faithful to God. And guess who does the multiplying? <laughs> Praise God, it's him, not me, because I can't do it. And we find the same thing repeated in several ministries or, or miracles and moments in Jesus' life. Think about that water to wine. You know, it wasn't just a taste thing from one quality to the other, but it was really a multiplying of the effect of what was in those jars. It was taking one thing and converting it into something multiplied in its expression. And someone said that that moment, you have kept the best until now. And that's what I'd like my life to be like as God looks back on it. Not, I don't really need to prove it to anyone else. But God, would you like to say you kept the best to last to me? I'd love that. You know, just give it everything and let God multiply it. What about the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000? In, in the Bible, we see these in Matthew 14 and Matthew 15, these two occasions where God steps up again. And Jesus does a miraculous work. The disciples felt, you're asking us to give them food? We can't do that. 
You know, he says, you, you feed them. You can do it. And they're saying, no, all we have is this little boy and he's got you know, five loaves and two small fish. And the emphasis is on the word small in the scripture. So what do you do with that? Jesus knew what was going to happen. So he said, get everyone to sit down. You know the story. And then he starts to praise God, starts spreading it out. And they do the distributing. They do the multiplication. He just gives it to them and they're taking it out further and further to the next group of 50, the next group of 50, until 5,000 men plus the women and children have been fed. And so we're reminded by this that God is saying to us, we all just need to relax a bit in this process of multiplying because it's him that does it, not us. One point that we want to make here is that there is always more bread and fish in the realm of the spirit than what we can see. There's always more result than what we can see. So just, you know, just be willing for God to use you. Jesus invites us to experience and to participate in the provision of the supernatural multiplication. You know, we say that we want to be led by the Spirit to cooperate and partner with the Spirit. That's what we're about. So some cold hard facts I want to just share quickly with you. You know I'm a numbers man, so here we go. Christianity ranks at first place in the net gains through religious conversion. What does all that mean? Let me read you from Wikipedia, which is the Bible. Well, not quite. Christian population growth is the population growth of a global Christian community. According to a 2011 Pew Research survey, there is 2.19 billion Christians around the world in 2010, more than three times as many as the 600 million recorded in 1910. Not bad, eh? From 600 to 2.19, 600 million to 2.19 billion. So, however, the rate is of growth is slower than the overall population growth. So we, we look good on one scale, but there's still some room for growth. Growth. The World Christian Encyclopedia also cites that Christianity ranks at first place in net gains through religious conversion. Christianity gains about 65.1 million people, I'll be doing a test later, (laughs) annually due to factors like birth rate, religious conversion and migration, while losing 27.4 million. So around about 39 million more Christians every year in the world. That sounds good. I like that. You see, our problem is we sit in the church and we sometimes see more people in church and sometimes see less. And we hear the media saying, oh, the church is in decline. But it's not actually true. God is multiplying the church today around the world and we get to be a part of that. This is our neighbourhood where God plants us to, to do our part of it. But all around the world today, people are coming to faith. Millions of them. Every year, billions of them. Okay? These things are really moving for God. And you know where it's happening? It's in the places where God has sent people to just trust him and obey him. Where they will do all the things that are necessary to, to be in the right place for God to multiply the ministry. We cannot look at people and say, look, they're doing things right And so we follow their pattern and find an answer. We look at God and say, am I being obedient? And he will do whatever is required. So what's the motivation for living mission? It's not a competition to make more numbers at all. Rather, it's like this. Motivation for living mission is obedience to the one who sends us. It is faith in the supernatural provision of the one who sends us. And the motive of the one who sends us. Why does God want us to go? Because he loves all of us. All the unsaved, all the lost. Do you notice we don't use the word lost in church anymore? Why don't we do that? Because it's exactly what happens to someone who doesn't know Christ. They get to that gateway we call death. They're lost. Let me dull it down for you. They will die forever and be in hell. 
Is that dull enough? <laughs> you know, I don't like to say those words, hell and all that stuff. But isn't that what God says? Isn't that what the reality is? So this interest in multiplying is very positive. <laughs> it's to get people on the right side with God. So let's understand this. Matthew eighteen twelve says this. Christ speaks of the shepherd who notices one of his sheep has strayed away from the flock. And he says, and if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than the 99 that did not wander off. If you want to know what God's heart is towards these, this is what the scripture says. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Not one. Not one of those least important people that we think are least important. Not one of those who we think, oh, it wouldn't really suit them, so I won't talk to them. Not one of those who we work alongside of who have a strong spirituality that isn't godly or Christian. Not one of those does God say, don't worry about those ones. I think we've used this illustration before. Imagine we went on a picnic when the kids were young and... Uh, Dot and I, you know, we've got two children. It's time to go home, so we say, oh, where's Aaron? Can't see him. That's all right. We've got Megan. That's enough. Let's go home. Is that our attitude towards the lost? You know, what does God feel about that? Just get in, get in your car, go home. It's all right. Somehow someone's going to reach those other people. I feel a bit nervous about that. The way it makes me feel is like, I've been neglecting what God has been intending and I haven't gone deeper into what he wants. So I want it to be what God wants. Let's move on. Yes, okay. We want to say this. The living mission began in the heart of the Father with him not wanting any, not even the least and the littlest, to remain lost. For to be lost is to perish. To be lost is to perish. We need to know that. This living mission began with the death and burial and resurrection of God's own son. A great cost, a great price. As we thought about during our communion, what did it cost for God to bring this multiplication? It cost Jesus his life. And it's now being outworked by his spirit, the Holy Spirit, in the lives of faithful followers of Jesus, who take seriously that commandment, go. It's about everyday disciples, making disciples, every day. That's why we're an Acts 2 church, because in the Acts 2 it says, and daily people were being added, but really multiplied, into the kingdom. It was an expected thing, but it didn't have to be drummed up. Every, evangelism and discipleship, fruitfulness are Christ's call to action. When this became clear in our word for, from God that several years ago, we saw how God wanted us to think seriously and intentionally about multiplying the church. That's why we began to think about Acts 2 and we began to think about the DNA. It's in God's creation where even back in the garden, Jesus, God sorry, looked at the Adam and Eve and said, go forth and multiply, right? And he put seeds in every plant. What are those about? so they could multiply themselves. If God had just created all those things on the first day and didn't give the provision for automatic multiplication to happen, then it would have been a short-lived planet. Things would have ended on the seventh or eighth day. You know, Nothing would have been ready. But God is saying, no, I want and expect my creation to be multiplying. And so, why doesn't it just happen? I thought this would be a good time for Simon to come and give us his sex, sex talk again. But <laughs> not that kind of multiplying, no. We're talking about why doesn't our sharing of faith just happen? Why don't we just multiply the faith so easily in our friends? Have you thought about it? I wonder what your answers would be. I'll pass the mic around. It'll be interesting to know what we really get down to at the bottom line. So here's some thoughts about that. We're talking about the fishing of people, right? Why is it so difficult for me to be in on this multiplication of living mission? Two things we face, the enemies, if you like, to our mission is isolation and fear. 
Isolation is that sense of I'm me against the world. You know, what I have to say is so small, so insignificant. Who would listen to me anyway? And that's, again, the problem of saying, who's responsible for multiplying? Not me. What I have to say is dramatic and dynamic. It has to do with a whole change to the radical look at life and what life on planet Earth is all about. It's getting in touch with the Creator. It's finding out that His Son has come for me, that my sin is repairable, that it's something I can do and I can share that good news with someone else. So I'm not so isolated after all. I look at my basket and there's just a couple of fish. You know, not much there, a few loaves. <laughs> it's not very big, is it? I mean, I'm no good at this. God, do you really want me to do that? Bring it to me, he said. Bring it to me. Do what you can with it and I'll do the rest. And gee, it's so easy when you think of it that way. Multiplying the kingdom, just faithfully turning up with the bits you have and saying, bless it, Lord, bless it. And the same thing is true about many areas of extending the faith. All I have is water, Lord, but they need wine. <laughs> How's that going to happen? All right, you get the idea. Stop and think for a moment. You and I have not much to do with it. The provision is from the one who sends. That we offer, what we offer is not our own brand or efficiency in doing life, but all the sufficient, unified singularity of the one himself that brings life. It's God that's going to bring life as he has always done. It's not we, what we have to offer that counts, but our trust in and our obedience to the truth that we have about the one who sins. So let's look at the structure then of how we do preparing for mission. The first thing is the Holy Spirit. One of our enemies might be a lack of structure. We do require a plan to live out our mission assignment. So someone once wisely said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And that's very true in the area of sharing faith. What if we never actually sat down and had a plan? Well, we took that seriously in our church and God showed us something like the 411 plan that will help you and I to become as efficient as we can be. If that plan doesn't work for you, don't worry. Use whatever means God does use. Um, Pastor Craig Rochelle often used to say and still says that we'll do anything short of sin to win others for Christ. You know, what will it take? Whatever God says it will take. And so we want to talk about the Holy Spirit first of all. Being spirit-led is our value in our church. Part of our reason for the strong emphasis on daily study and reflection on God's word is so that we'll be in tune with what the Spirit of God has to say. I grew up, and very quickly tell you in a story, when I was a young Christian, not very experienced by the way, there was this movement happening around the world called the charismatic movement. It was infecting and infesting all sorts of places. We had charismatic Anglicans and charismatic Catholics and even Baptists, could you believe that? You know, there was all sorts of people that were coming to faith in Christ through Backyard meetings. I used to go to one in a garage. I mean, not a fill up your car garage, just a, a little shed where lots of people crammed in and we sang the old spiritual songs. You know, and we didn't know the King Jim's version wasn't the way to sing it, so we just sang those songs. But you know, I'm saying the Holy Spirit took hold of our generation. And much of what we see in the multiplying of the church around the world today is the outworking of the fruit of those ministries as they grew up and began to share faith with others. And my point is this. We were not a special generation, but we tuned into what God's Spirit was doing and things changed. Things changed in our lives. We stopped looking at life the way we used to. It's from start to finish a spiritual exercise, not just about clever apologetics and arguments. There's a place to argue your case, stand up for what you believe, but that's not going to win a lot of people, I'm telling you now. It's good to have the right answers, which God gives, but that's not all. It's about the gift of evangelism, which is God's spirit and life in you. 
We look quickly at the seven signs of John as another tool. We're actually doing some of those in our village in the next season just to revisit this area. Seven signs of John are seven instances where Jesus turned up and did a miraculous thing. And you could just ask somebody, how would you like to read the Bible with me? And you could take the time just to ask a few questions about that scripture that you've read together. So I'm planning to do that. I've asked uh, a lady at work, actually, if she's interested, and she said she'll get back to me. So that's a start. We'll see where it goes. And then he says in Matthew 28, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Pray and go. Pray, yes, but do go. We have to be off our chair, ready to go. No one else is going to reach your generation, only you. And I've found out that Facebook only goes so far. <laughs> really. It doesn't really win too many people. You can set the stage, get an invitation for a sit-down maybe. But you know what we've got to do is actually talk to our friends and let them know who Jesus is, the one we love, why we love him, what's your story. We'll get to that in a moment. So we come to the 411 training. Uh, living mission is all about having a preparation. And so we saw in that introduction video a minute ago, the 411 is four questions. Why do we go? Who are we? And who do we go to? What is it that we will share? And when will we go? And the one hour is possibly how long it might take. And one sheet of paper. This is You'll be given a sheet of paper later. Okay, looks like this one here. Okay, exhibit A. And it's only one sheet of paper, but it's got all this stuff on it. Both sides are used very economically. So there you go. The point is, 411 is about having a plan, just being prepared to go. I'm putting up a couple of screens just so you can get an idea as it flows through. If you enjoy this, you'll find the why is in your identity with Christ. And I won't go into too much about that. You can see that there. The who is called the oikos, not the awkward, but the oikos. It's the group that loves you and you love them. So it's not that hard to make a connection with those people and to pray into that. What will you share? There's been two parts to that. And when, this is the biggie, when. You know, it's... Um, I won't name names, but somebody asked me a few weeks ago, or we were talking actually, and I was introduced in the conversation, about budgeting. You know, this person wanted to do a budget, and they keep putting it off. So I said to them, just make an appointment with yourself. Put your name in your diary on a certain date, a certain time, and that's your appointment to do your budgeting. It'll get done that way. And uh, so that's what we can do with our sharing as well. Begin to be intentional about it. So there's the structure. In Luke 17, 7, it says, I want to kind of finish this off now. When a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in, eat with me? No, he says, prepare my meal, put on your apron, serve me while I eat. And then you can eat later. And does it matter? Does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. And so in the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. Now, I'm not a person that pushes the duty side of Christianity, but Christ mentioned it, so we've got to put it in there. And the fact he mentioned it was because we can fall into the lull of, I'm okay, things are great, I'm a Christian, Ah, I'm so glad I'm going to heaven. Whew, who was that just went past? Doesn't matter. I'm on my way to heaven. You know what I'm saying? Our duty as a servant is not to question the master. It's just to do what he's called us to do. And the last thing we want to look at here, he says in the same way, when you obey me, you are just unworthy servants doing what he asks you to do. Jesus once said to his disciples, I'll finish with this, you are the light of the world. And then he used an illustration. He said, you know, you take a lamp, you don't put it under the bed, you put it up on a pedestal where it can shine out as far as it can go. And the beautiful thing about that light is 
It doesn't ask questions, am I shining? It doesn't say, who am I shining on? It doesn't even say, am I multiplying my light? It just shines. And I think that's part of the, the, this message I'm feeling, is that God's just saying, just shine. Just do what you ask to do, please, and you will be all that you need to be because I will do the reflecting, I'll do the multiplying, I will do the advancement on what your effort is. So can we please just be fruitful and multiply? <laughs> just fill the earth and let God do that in you.